Joining me now on the phone is Ray Dalio, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer at Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund with $160 billion in assets under management. He's also the author of the new book, Principles. Ray, it's great to have you with me. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Now, it's interesting. I thought this was going to be a book about investing, but it's actually a compilation of principles, as you call them, on work and life. The investing part is actually coming in a separate book. What kind of audience are you targeting for this book? Well, I've, anybody who's uh, trying to be successful, and uh, whether it's um, any organization, it's about um, how to have great audacious goals and to fail and to learn fr from mistakes and to have relationships. It's, a, it's basically um, a, a compendium of things I learned along the way and wrote over the, next, the last 40 years uh, to solve the problems I encountered. So um, it's uh, much broader based than the investment world. And you talk about how Bridgewater almost shut down earlier on in your career. You lost so much money. In fact, you had to borrow money from your father. What did you learn from this experience? Yeah, it was one of the uh, worst and best experiences I had. It was one of the most painful experiences I had. And it, it changed everything because I, it changed my mindset from thinking I'm right to thinking how do I know I'm right? Um, it led me to appreciate um, a path that allowed me to raise my probabilities of being right. It, 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 it allowed me to uh, create an idea meritocracy in which I could bring independent thinkers, strong independent thinkers, who could disagree with each other and value that disagreement to make uh, decisions that would be much better than I ever could make alone. It taught me uh, to write down my principles. This is basically, like I say, a compendium of principles written over a long period of time. And by writing down those principles um, and then communicating them among ourselves and refining those principles so that whenever we encountered a specific type of thing, we knew uh, how to approach it and agree that that changed everything. That, uh, that type of principle writing and then converting those principles to algorithms, which we started to do 20 years ago, and allow the um, computers to help us make decisions simultaneously um, was all really largely a product of, uh, of that. It significantly raised our probabilities of being right. And Bridgewater is an idea meritocracy. Uh, that's essentially where the best ideas win out, right? Exactly. The, the thing I learned um, is that probably one of the greatest tragedies of mankind is individuals being attached to their opinions that they s keep stuck in their heads, and they don't put out and stress test those opinions, and then take in the ideas of others. It, it, it's the greatest tragedy of mankind because it, it's so easy to fix if you could have that quality, thoughtful disagreement. In all, the three things that we uh, do right and in order to have an idea of meritocracy, and I would uh, recommend it to everybody, is three things you need to do. The first is you put, need to put your honest thoughts on the table. Everybody right. needs to do that so they're out there and they can be examined. The second thing you need to do is to have ways of having thoughtful disagreements so that people can find out what the best answers are, not just the ones that happen to be in their heads. And the third thing they need to do is when they have those disagreements that remain, even after that, is to have protocols for getting past those disagreements that are idea meritocratic. And that's really been the secret to our success, because you know in the markets, in order to be able to beat the market, you have to have an independent point of view that is different from the consensus because right. the consensus is built into the price. Uh, now, Ray, the Wall Street Journal reported that Bridgewater is raising money for a new China fund. What is the latest on this, and, and what is so appealing about China to you? I mean, many are worried about rising debt levels, slowing economic growth. What's your take? I've been going to China since 1984, long before they had any money, um, and I've been enjoying that and over those periods of time I've uh, built these wonderful relationships and I've seen them from um, in 1989 there was a group uh, in China of, of 
uh, seven people who, when they didn't have a financial system, uh, were working out of a, 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 a dingy hotel room, and that was for them to build the financial system. And I've had a pleasure of all through that time to develop wonderful relationships um, that, with time, um, helped to build, uh, help them think through their, um, uh, you know, their institutions. And so the relationship has been fantastic. So naturally, what we want to do uh, is to continue to grow with uh, them as they're growing in their financial markets. And the way they've opened up their financial markets and created um, capital market innovation over the last three years, really, I mean, it's been an incredibly fast pace, means that they're, they have liquid markets which have depth um, and, um, you know, accessibility. So, of course, we're going to want to be part of that. China's debt levels, do, is that a worry for you as you explore deeper into China? China, China has uh, a much lower level of debt, but they, have a ch debt, they definitely have a debt issue. But the debt is denominated in their own currency. And what I found is that their economic policy makers are, are very, very um, uh, smart and sensible people. They've been, uh, the world has been talking about the debt problem for a long time, and we were one of the first to bring up the fact that there is a, a debt problem. But um, the, and when a debt is denominated in one's own currency, it's manageable the usual ways. You know, in other words, you might extend the maturity of the debt. You might alter whose balance sheet it's on. You might um, have the interest rate uh, change. You go through certain processes that we've been through to be able to manage that debt. And, and there's, there, they've done an excellent job. I'm most importantly um, interested in the capabilities of the people who did it. We went through our particular debt problems. Every country does it. I'm, uh, I'm genuinely excited about the quality of, of the, the leadership and in terms of practicality. They can get st stuff done, and right. um, their reforms are a move toward, you know, sensible, mo uh, much more market-driven um, economics, but with uh, guidance. So uh, I, I see the innov innovation. I'm very excited ab about China. But anyway, uh, it's like your question would be a little bit like asking me, would you want to leave the United States? Because the United States has a debt problem. I was here in the United States. I love the markets. We did well in 2008. In our business, the key question is whether you make the dis decisions correctly. Not There's not such thing as a bull market or a bear market. 2008, um, because we anticipated the crisis, we right. did well. In any country, uh, it's the same set of rules. So China is no different than us investing in any other country that has um, li uh, liquidity and the right kind of markets. Whether they go up or down, we'll, you know, we'll be there. There's no good reason not to be in China. And there's a special appeal because I'm, you know, I know it well and I've been there for a long time. And I also wanted to ask you, I mean, we've had unprecedented central bank stimulus that has helped push stocks to record highs, yet we've recently been given signals from the Fed, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England that that stimulus is set to pull back a bit. What would waning central bank stimulus mean for stocks, in your view? I did a 30-minute video on how the economic machine works in the same situations. It works the same way over and over again. And so where we are in that, that provides a context, is we're by and large in the middle part of our economic cycles in which um, the printing of money or the uh, is coming to an, an end. Um, and, um, and it's an end of um, that part of the cycle. Um, as a result of that, uh, we are not going to have um, the the long the interest rates go down further we are not going to have the risk premiums shrink further uh, we are going to uh, be in a situation where uh, we're not going to have a material tightening but we're going to have a situation in which we the 2008 to now period is ended and the key in this period is to um, be very, very cautious about tightening. And so I think you're going to see central banks um, very, very, very cautious or uh, hardly at all doing tightening. And so it, you'll, you'll lose the pushing up, but you probably won't get the 
moves that would uh, be the knocking down of, of those kinds of markets. From this point forward, it's going to mean um, what is the actual change in profitability um, for the most part. So it's not going to be interest rates. It's not going to be risk premiums uh, changing much. It's going to be um, what the actual uh, movement to the bottom line is. So that's why tax reform um, is, is an issue. The tax rate that corporations pay is going to be an issue. Um, if you take um, the stimulation, what will it mean when you have deregulation? Deregulation is on the margin of stimulant. So you're going to have certain amounts of stimulants in there, not much stimulants. Um, so it's not going to make a big difference, I don't believe, from this part forward. I think what's going to make a bigger difference is the situation in terms of the two-tiered economy. In other words, right. um, this, this large percentage of the – there are really two economies. There are more than that, but think of it as two economies. There, the and averages are totally misleading. The top one-tenth of one percent of the population's net worth is equal to the bottom 90 percent combined, and that's becoming an issue. And so how that issue is dealt with um, um, is going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, an important driver, and how conflict is de dealt with. It's not just the conflict between those groups. It's conflicts in ideology, um, conflicts internationally. I think that this issue of uh, politics and conflicts will be a, an important one. I'm pleased um, that we're having more of a um, capitalist approach to this than a socialist approach to dealing with this issue. I think that that's a relief. And I'm uh, relatively p pleased also that what I was seeing as, uh, for up until recently, um, a lot of uh, conflict, uh, little signs of working in a bipartisan way to get past some of those conflicts um, in order to uh, deal with some of those issues together. So that's it in a nutshell. Now, Ray, in the book, you talk about how you love and have benefited from artificial intelligence, but you also talk about the importance of the people behind those computers. What's your take on artificial intelligence in terms of what it means for Wall Street jobs and the broader global economy? I've learned over the last 20 years to take that decision-making can be put into algorithms. In other words, the process was uh, come up with a principle of what you would do in a certain set of circumstances, write those criteria down, and then convert those principles into algorithms. And then I learned that the, the computer operating in parallel with me uh, was extremely powerful. That's how we make our, all of our investment decisions, and that's also how we're making a lot of the people decisions. And um, I know the fact that you're going to see this happen pervasively. Um, in other words, algorithmic decision-making are going to produce uh, better decision-making and replace a lot of people. And, and, and you're seeing this happen in, in many of the ways we execute orders and our transactions and so all that. Much, much better decision-making in many ways. Um, I also think that a big question is how do you come up with those algorithms? In other words, there is um, machine learning. And, if, and the question is whether one has uh, understanding behind those algorithms. Because I learned in the markets before that uh, for, for a long time I watched many firms go broke because they were doing this um, machine learning and algorithmic decision making because they didn't have the understanding, a deep understanding of the cause-effect relationships. They bet that the things that happened in the past would happen in the future. So I think that we're going to see a lot more of that. I'm very excited about that. It has implications in terms of employment and so on, uh, but it is also dangerous because if you um, – two rules for danger, two red flags. Do you understand the criteria that are in those algorithms so that you can say, ah, that's logical and I buy into it, or are you blindly following – what the uh, algorithms that have been determined by uh, machine learning come. If you're doing the first, and if the, f if the future is different than it has been in the past, because the past is what that, those algorithms were based on, if the future can be different from the past, and you don't understand the deep logic, you are probably going to blow up or have a, a, a problem with that. And so I think that that's going to be an issue of our society going forward.
All right, Ray, in the final uh, couple of seconds here, any advice for young people on how to get a job at Bridgewater? Obviously, they should study your principles, but any advice for young people? Um, the, the first and most important thing for anybody who wants to get a job at, at Bridgewater is to uh, find out whether you've got a great fit. The emotional um, ways of, um, you know, this idea of meritocratic process, this idea of thoughtful disagreement, to look into what it really is like. I would recommend they take a look at the TED Talk, 16-minute TED Talk. And, I, and in that TED Talk, I basically lay out the picture of what the place is like. In that 16-minute TED Talk, if that place sounds right for them, then, you know, let us know and we'll work through it. All right, Ray, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott.